Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Tom, for <laughs> assisting. <laughs> um, I arrived on uh, last weekend, Saturday, after a long drive, and uh, I arrived in Jeunalp and Les Anchettes uh, about two in the morning, and loaded the car, and uh, I took a walk up the, up the lovely valley there, and it was a clear night, extremely clear, um, as we've had all week, and you could not only see the stars, but you could see the, you know that haze of constellations behind it, it was like you were just looking into the universe, and uh, it was a really welcomed view for me, having spent the last almost two years living in uh, living on uh, Putney Hill. Um, <laughs> so I looked at this, and it it just it, it reminded me that what I'm looking at is actually energy, and you could see deep deep into it. I mean, it was amazing. It was so clear, and a few things came to me from that, uh, from the, the studies and the work I've been involved in in the last 10 years. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that that energy that I was relating to, uh, believing in, uh, that I could, uh, that I thought I could see there, I could also feel in myself. So it was like an outer universe and the inner universe. And uh, it, it, it was a moment because it, it sort of, I thought I'd been asked to, to speak and do this uh, a couple of weeks ago and didn't really know where to start. And, and, and that, for me, for that moment, I thought, well, well of course, the, the work that I have got involved in through my studies and research and practice with clients over the last 10 years is about energy. And it's given me that that, uh, that added view, that, or a realization that when I do ski coaching now, I'm working with energy. And that's so long there's been some talk about 25 years ago. Um, and so I was sitting there at the back and reflecting on that and realizing that when I played a, a, a part in that, uh, along with many other people, uh, we were concerned with more mechanical stuff. It wasn't the person. It wasn't what uh, Henry was referring to this morning as the human element. Uh, not then, but it is now. The other thing that I uh, recalled last Saturday night when I was looking at the stars and you feel the energy <coughs> and there's that sense of being alive. Um, even though I hadn't slept for quite a number of hours, but uh, was that I really felt as though I was in the present moment, the now. And then I realized that what I was looking at is, couldn't be farther away from the present moment. It might have been millions of light years away. The light that I was seeing from the stars is probably millions and millions of years in the past. But yet I felt in a moment. And there's a sort of a paradox there. You know, the energy I felt, the light I saw was in the past. And I realized that actually in any present moment or now, it's only found in the self, on the inner universe. Yeah. And so the light I was seeing, it might have been to me, it was the present moment, but actually it's old stuff, it's old stuff. Um, and uh, that took me to the realization that what I've been um, involved with and where I've come with my journey with, uh, with this stuff is moving from a quite a technical, physical, mechanical, plenty of boxes to tick and uh, yeah I've been part of creating those boxes um, and over the years I've become less comfortable with living in boxes and ticking stuff 
Um, so that little chat this morning from from from, from Jazz Henry's, um, and also that realization when I was arriving here that actually when we're ski teaching, my perspective where I'm coming from now is much more as someone that is working. Uh, manipulating, guiding, recognizing not only the energy of the learner, but my own energy as a coach and teacher. Uh, so that's really what I want to uh, expand on and, 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 and talk about. Um, <coughs> so about learning, about openness, about accepting, um, and a uh, where that crystallizes is the beginning of getting to know ourselves in a professional context and maybe a personal context, but I'll be keeping it to the professional uh, the professional context. Um, so my story in skiing began when I was 12. Uh, this is not me <laughs> at 12. Um, some of you will uh, might recognize the place. Um, and and I, we went to... We went to uh, skiing lessons in our PE uh, class. The PE teacher uh, took us. I was 12. Uh, it, I, was, I lived in South Wales. The ski slope was Pontypool. And uh, we, um, we just went and played. Uh, it was part of PE. It was part of school. We then went to the ski club. And the ski club was involved. We went to some ski racing. And we played. And that, that playing was uh, reinforced by... Uh, the, the coach that we had, the we, the little team of us that I had at the time that some of you will uh, maybe know of, um, and I realise I realise now that he uh, had a huge impact on the way that I perceive the work I do now. And his name is Colin Whiteside, um, and he um, he was able to. <laughs> he was able to <coughs> encourage us in such a way that we went to play. We didn't know what we were doing other than playing skiing. Um, and we'll let this play. This is just a little clip, which is a, a, a recent clip. Why do you love skiing? My dad took me on holiday and I thought it was quite fun. My mum used to be a ski instructor and I like skiing because it's really fun. It's fun and very fun and fast. Because I can. Because I enjoy it. <laughs> so I enjoy it. Because it's so much fun. I love it. I can do it better than anything else sports wise. I like it. I did it since I was tiny. I wanted to. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, Does this only apply to the Welsh, though? <laughs> <laughs> We're a special bunch. Don't we? <laughs> we had fun as well. We know that. So we tried to, uh, I, I've tried to. Uh, that's what I remember, and that, that was just seen by Robin Kellen just not so long ago. And so we played, and we, I try and take the play into the work I do at the moment. One of, one of the concepts of mm. mindfulness and the application of mindfulness is, in fact, about bringing out the inner child, in a sense that you perceive, one perceives learning as a child would, with less rules. You get involved in it. As an adult, um, I, I strive to do the inner child and learning as a learner, but I, I end up as, uh, as, as that and realize that it's, it's actually an inner idiot that I've got, and not, the, not so much the child. Uh, that's what it sort of feels like, but then that's just my own perception of it. Um, so, yeah, that, uh, that story from, from all those days in, uh, in Pontypool on the dry slope, and I know some of you uh, here, who's a nodding, also have those similar types of backgrounds where we went and we played we got involved in something because we loved the something not because we wanted to go and work in that uh, I went away ski racing and with a bunch of other people and had these which are now realized totally deluded ideas about being in the Olympics um, in fact two of the fellas who was in our little band did get to the Olympics um, 
and uh, the rest of us went off and we uh, we went uh, ski racing and uh, and then I went uh, to uh, to college in Edinburgh the same as uh, as the same course as Jazz did actually and um, and got involved in the national squads and coaching the national squad in Scotland, becoming a basic trainer and all that kind of thing. And I remember I, I, one of my roles latterly at Snowsport Scotland was to uh, establish a, a coach's qualification. So uh, I, I started a, a course which was called a club coach. And it basically was the, 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 the root of the beginning of what we have now have as the APC uh, levels. And so I did a number of these. Um, and I remember at the time I was referring back to uh, Nancy Green. Nancy Green was a Canadian coach. Brilliant stuff. She just got the kids involved, lots of play, uh, lots of investigation, experimentation, inquiry, all that kind of thing. So, you know, I comes into Scotland and bring all this with me and actually know what the parents and what the coaches want to do is to run games. We've got to run games. And I can, I can remember at the time there was some frustration about it. it was just this, it was a narrowing, what I saw, a narrowing of experiential activity, not, not an explosion. I mean, at 10, 11, 12 years old, I wanted, to, I wanted to open out the experiences and the learning experiences of the, of the, of the, of the young kids, of the bands and lassies. But uh, alas, that, that wasn't, wasn't to be. So um, we, had some, we had some great times. That's me with one of the teams, Greer Adams, uh, uh, who worked with me at the time and some fellows and now there's actually must be someone on there that is also a baby trainer. Uh, Lane Adam, I think on the far left, is Marie. Uh, but anyway, we were this was back in the eighties. Um, anyway, so that that uh, that story, fast forward that to you know, my story to about 10 years ago, where I started to become, uh, I, I, I was able, I had, a, I had a situation where I could become more, in, more involved in learning about more of the peripheral stuff at the time there. I've always been involved in learning, teaching, as you know, as probably I'm very involved in sharing that and developing modules within Bainsey to, uh, to actually help instructors to to learn all about the learning and teaching, and, it, and, it, and it's always um, been something close to my heart. And it's two sides of the coin. I don't think we can look at teaching if you're not looking at the learning. Um, and so when I came across all these mindset concepts and games and training through, uh, through my studies, looking at the Buddhist tradition, to be honest, about 10, 15 years ago, all of a sudden, I, you know, we were being taught this in learning about mindfulness in the context of mental training in a, in a Buddhist uh, a deity. And I saw this and thought, wow, this is, this is just like psychology. This is like the sports psychology I was doing back in the days that uh, Jazz and I were at Edinburgh uh, um, uh, P College, studying sports. Um, so with that training that I started to embark in, was training in uh, some fairly deep meditation and <laughs> contemplative practices, <laughs> which on a personal level I thought would make me a better person. But, um, that, that hasn't been the case. <laughs> I'm, st I'm still the idiot. <laughs> uh, but uh, I sometimes am. Um, but the difference now is that I know I'm being the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> So, on to the research. Um, when I, so Adam, uh, um, Aberdeen University then set up a three year master's degree program, the first one in the UK, uh, in studies in mindfulness. Um, I was accepted onto the first cohort uh, in 2010 and uh, manipulated my snow sport professional work around that, so basically I went to work for some ski schools uh, rather than jaunt about the Alps trying to do my own thing, which is a 24-7, as some of you know, to enable me to do a 9-to-5. I did that and hid away in a little hut up in the 
back end of Liz Ark in the plan for two or three years, and uh, a little bit in Val d'Isere as well. And um, that culminated in a, in a year's study. Um, what I was looking at in the research question in my studies there for the MSc was, it, was what would the learning experience be if one applied the principles of mindfulness to the coaching teaching process? So I was interested essentially in the learning experience of the learner, something that I've realized over the past 25 years of my career was absolutely crucial to whatever that experience was, to the way that the, our skiers, our clients actually value the product. They've had a great learning experience, then that's what they take away. And it's what the learner takes away emotionally that is the real thing that people value the product. They value us. Yeah, it's a great lesson. I feel great. Um, you know, they might have been skating about on some ice uh, in, in Kengorm on the time ago. You see that. Or, yeah. But that's essentially what, what I was looking into. So it was a process of me writing some coaching approaches based on the principles of mindfulness, the pillars of mindfulness in order to bring the learners into a place where one, if one would recognize it, would say that that, yes, I can see the mindfulness elements coming out of that. And so I uh, teamed up with some buddies from Edinburgh uh, University who orchestrated the, the, uh, the parameters for me in terms of getting students and people. Also, I worked with uh, some uh, instructors, a great bunch at Aberdeen uh, Ski Slope at Garth Deep. And I took about 25, 30 skiers through 12 hours of coaching. And I, um, <coughs> we did it on the snow and on the, and on the plastic. Some involved individual activity. I might touch this, but I might need to. Um, and uh, there's a video on here. It's an embedded video. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. So you may, uh, this, is, this is a skier. Uh, a very still skier. A very still skier at the moment. Doing some individual practice. It goes a bit fuzzy, but it comes back. If we could read maybe it's fuzzy. Individual practice. And when we see a skier like that doing an individual practice, it's very much, we're looking at it from the outside, but all the stuff that's going on the inside, there is the feedback, the loops, the feeling, the sensations. I'd be surprised if anybody knows, knows who this is. This was taken oh, probably. Right. I thought it was Jim. Pardon? It was jazz. You think it's jazz? <laughs> right. Anybody else? Jazz, who do you think it is? It is indeed Jazz Lamb. Oh. It is indeed Jazz Lamb. Can we play it once more? Just once more. The power. So I'm going to pay yeah. for this, I think. Yes, it changes it. This is Jazz Lamb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's just proving I never had it. <laughs> Absolutely. On big skis, uh, this was one of the first, if not the first, club coach course that I ran in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. See that left foot? Just <laughs> 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 Old habits die hard. I knew. Yeah. He's still doing it, he's got it then. And he's got it even more now. Piece, I it wasn't, that was a two piece, that was a. Uh, <laughs> 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 I was the race, the purple racing pants to go Great. with it as well. <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> I've had a little bit of spare time the last few months and I have been looking through some of the old VHS tapes that I've got and I found that home tech bit of kit and you can Fantastic. do that. So that came up just the other week actually. So thank you for allowing that. Um, so yeah, there was group group activity that I coached the skis, and I did a, I did low, is a, 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 a qualitative um, sort of um, behavioural, educational, social science uh, study really. So I went away and hid myself in a in a hut 
for, uh, for six or nine months, as you do, and started to write this stuff up, and then came out with something like uh, 35,000 words. Um, and as usual for me, far, far too many. Um, so my thesis had a very big appendices. Um, <laughs> which is what I would advise to do by my supervisor. Um, so, what did I learn from it? What, what came out? Well, a few, a few snippets. Um, I asked loads of questions, gathered loads of information through, uh, through uh, the questionnaires and through focus groups. I didn't think that would come through. Um, but how would you describe your scope and levels of awareness during the sessions? Um, loads of people on this, on the, on this side it says the awareness was intrinsic. It was to do with the stuff from the self. Here we go. So I got into asking questions, quite detailed questions, not just, well, awareness or how was that feeling, but it was where, when, what muscular tension, awareness of limbs, kinesthetic stuff. Okay, so we went into quite some detail and both with the group at Aberdeen uh, uh, Ski Centre, Snow Sports Centre, uh, were, many of them were instructors, not all, and the PE students who were second year students, they had some awareness of what, what we were doing with this. It wasn't, um, so, so, and, and I, I thought that was a benefit to the study. Um, the learning experience, yeah, Highly on, on positive, but many people say it was enjoyable, effective, fun, uh, uh, valuable, interesting. So I was getting close. I wanted to know what the learning experience was. What, how would they explain? How would they explain it? So the things that they were saying. So at some point I thought, well, perhaps what I'm doing is, I'm, as, the, as, as both the deliverer uh, working in the investigation, the research, and who was then following it up, was somehow shaping their views about what they said. So I did some focus groups uh, that was led by somebody else, some of the lecturers at uh, Edinburgh University. And the same things came out. Um, the fact that most of, the, most of the people were aware of some sort of learning context, not just in skiing, but in other sports, may have had an impact in their ability to articulate what it was they were, they, they were, they were experiencing inside. But overwhelmingly, it was a raising of, a, a raising of, um, of awareness through, and, th and this surprised me to a certain point, what was the most useful thing you did? And it came out, well, I was doing tasks. I was doing things. And the doing things with, in the context of helping the learner notice and feel what it was, was happening when they, was, when they were doing it, was a core element. So not a, not a lot of emphasis on uh, technical element. Feedback. Uh, part of the part of the, the, the model is to uh, incorporate uh, peer discussion, reflective sessions, just post performance, where people paired up and teamed up and encouraged to open and talk about what it is they noticed about their own learning experience in an open, non-judgmental way. Um, and that's great, I find that really, it's great fun orchestrating that and working in this mode. Um, and uh, one or two people would get up and uh, um, walk away and ski off and then come back. Others would be right into that. And, and that's how it is. We're different. Yeah, we're humans. We're part of humankind. But we're all unique and different in in one or quite large ways. So some like that. 
want to talk about it. We, we know about it. You're probably sitting there and thinking, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that person about that. And then others won't say anything. They might have to walk. And some may not sit comfortably with the uh, reflective process. So one size doesn't fit all. However, recent, recent, uh, 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 some recent research into brain and uh, how to operate, and there's a huge amount more now than there was just five years ago, um, would uh, suggest this term of uh, neural plasticity. Uh, which essentially, the way I understand it, said, well, if you can think in, if you can think in different ways, and move through the discomfort of thinking and working cognitively in different ways, then ultimately that's going to open more pathways within the, within the brain in order to take on new information. Certainly, that's quite a different to 20 years ago, where we were talking about multiple intelligences, emotional intelligence, where you either had it or you didn't. So you had to work in one way. That's why in those 20 years ago, we were saying in the teaching module, use the back, you know, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Why? Oh, well, some people may be more feelers, some more seers, and some more auditory. Um, nowadays, I think things are much more complex than that. Uh, we've got more information and research available to us. Um, key finding from the research. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this surprised me actually, this, uh, you know, it related, it was a pleasant surprise, related to the emotional state of the learner during, during the practice, during the session. The emotional state was heightened, there was a sense of responsibility, accountability. That seemed to work for most of the people I had in this small study, just to say between 25 and 30. And they the process of reflection, discovery, inquiring, curiosity was very comfortable. This only 25. So, okay, how does, uh, how does this, that's a bit of the research, if you want to have a look at the 35,000 words, you're very welcome, <laughs> send me an email and I'll <laughs> ping you the, uh, the document. I have broken it down and sometimes I do book bits and pieces on a, on a website that uh, I, I look at every uh, once every two years. Um, <laughs> everybody else looks at it uh, twice every three years. But, uh, um, yeah, so how does it, how does it sort of uh, sit? How does it uh, work through and, and play well? Well, skiing is a team sport. I believe skiing is a team sport. Okay, but what's the team? The team is Ourselves. This is a team here. There's a bit of cognitive stuff. There's the mind that's going on and on and on, that busy mind. And then there's the heart, there's the emotions, there's the feelings, the feeling, the, the fear, the exhilaration. There's all of that in there. And then there's the physical, my body. Just a few of them. The other part of the team, of course, is the equipment and then the context, the mountain. So I try and perceive the work that I do when I'm coaching people is that it's, it's a team sport. It's knowing the team. And that's the team. The team is the body, the mind, and the emotions. And I think through mindfulness, we can, we can learn a little bit more about those and maybe become more able. Um, also, the other, the other thing that I take with the, from the study and from the, from the mindfulness principles is the middle way. And of course, the middle way I've taken that from uh, some, you'll read some Zen and, and Buddhist texts, they talk about the middle path. And essentially, the middle path is about being in a space where one is, uh, where you can get yourself out of your own way. <coughs> really interesting this morning speaking to Henry, wasn't it? What a fantastic uh, approach to be taking, the humanistic approach. And, of course, he's talking about that knowing yourself more clearly, getting from what Kahneman on thinking fast and thinking slow uh, uh, talked about, working from moving away from doing the quick spontaneous, as we would talk about it in mindfulness, moving into being responding and moving away from reacting. Okay, so purposeful practice. Really interesting thing here. And we create our own path. Right, metaphorically and physically down the mountain. But through some of the approaches that I took with this, I found that it enabled learners to be 
uh, more comfortable, empowered maybe, um, although I'm not a big fan of that, that term, um, but able, their capacity to take and decide their own path was heightened because ultimately there was a greater awareness of what was going on inside themselves at the time. And uh, this fellow, yes, that's something that he said. And I, I, I believe not just in sports coaching, but in the, the life coaching and personal development coaching that I do, is the, the key to being adaptable is knowing oneself, knowing where you are, knowing what the mind is doing, knowing what the body is doing, knowing what the emotions are doing, and all of that energy inside. If we, can, if we, if we know that, become more clear about that, then I believe that we can be more effective in our profession, whatever profession that is. Henry was talking about doctors and anaesthetists and designers and architects. And that. It's the same in, 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 in to any profession. But there does seem to be in the last, I don't know how long it is, but certainly currently much more of uh, a critical mass who in different professions who are talking about a very similar thing. And I believe that similar thing is about our ability to notice what's happening when it's happening without preference. There, I managed to get the definition. That's, some of you like definitions, you're like, we can put it in a box, and one of the definitions, a very simple definition of mindfulness, is exactly that, knowing what's happening, when it's happening, without preference. And a lot of that in sport, I believe, comes down to, well, what's the attitude of the learner? So, you can reflect on different attitudes of learners and you get some that are this and some that are that and of course we endeavour to withhold our judgement of it because that may just uh, come out in our behaviour with that with that uh, client but we notice it and uh, it was Vince Lombardi uh, uh, one of the most famous basketball coaches in America that said that that attitude is not the only thing that it's absolutely everything because it arises from the inner energy it arises from our, our emotional energy and our physical energy. And uh, this, this, the chap in the centre here has actually been mentioned uh, this morning before, but uh, in, in the, uh, Henry mentioned the uh, Egan brothers. Uh, uh, Dan Egan is the one in the middle. Um, and uh, that's got nothing to do with this. And this is, uh, this is a resty and this is a, uh, Alex from Italy. So we've got an American and we've got two Italians standing, in, standing at the top of a, uh, a gallery on the, uh, the Pramacu and uh, above teams. And um, they're getting, as we all do in different situations in life, whatever the performance, we get ready. And we start to play. And uh, you're basically going through a process of, of, uh, of dreaming it and then doing it and then digging it. Dream it, do it, and dig it. The dreaming of it is about seeing. There's intention. We do it. We like it. <laughs> we do it. We get it done. We take action. And then you dig it. That's to do with motivation. And how deep and which ways you dig it will determine on whether you continue to dream it. And there's that sort of cycle. Dreaming doing and digging has a big impact, I think, on the work that we do as ski coaches. So, just very, just a few there for the, just some pointers to bring out, well, well what is this sort of mindfulness in terms of, what's the implications? Um, awareness is a massive thing. Self-awareness, developing awareness of body, of mind and emotions. So knowing, bringing about a knowing of what's happening. And of course, if we can coach, using some mindfulness principles, it leads us into a position where we can be less judgmental, more open, we can be more curious, our learners can become therefore more curious and open because they don't feel as though there's so many rights and wrongs. There's experimentation with a notion of curiosity. Uh, but we encourage uh, and reinforce curiosity. One of the ways of doing that is to encourage reflective practice. Mindfulness, 
principles are extremely useful for that because it encourages the learner to know what's happening when it's happening. So there's lots of noticing, witnessing, and awareness. There's some more words here which I'll go through, and uh, some of this can be put over onto a, a website, perhaps, or something. But I just want to, I just want to close with a couple of things. That this, this really, this, this does it. The best teachers are those who show you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. Well, how does that work in our school? Surely we've got to tell them. We've got to explain. We have to demonstrate. We have to imitate. We then have to correct. Eat it. That's, that's what I was saying 25 years ago. Well, I'm not saying that now. I'm not saying that that isn't appropriate. I'm saying, well, hey, there's other ways of approaching it as well, from a much more of an energy way. They say the good coaches, you know, those that can... Uh, we, we solve problems, don't we? We see opportunities and solve problems, I think, as coaches. And um, the good ones can, can do that. The good ones get the learners themselves to do that for themselves, don't they? Yeah, some questioning. And then the guru coaches seem to get the learners to do that without the learners knowing that they're doing it. They just go and play. And uh, then there's this sort of... <laughs> Yeah, because there's some talk in mindfulness, you know, about, well, okay, you know, it's very introspective, you know, you're living in the present moment, man. Um, and uh, bringing about, opening out a different channel, a channel different to thinking. It's cognitive, but it's a different type of channel. Um, and there's different ways of looking at it, but I know where it's really at. The ones that have really got it are the ones that know <laughs> that whatever is there internally, we can refill it. Through having an awareness of where you are at any particular time, whether it be on the mountain or in a class or with a, in a relationship, is having this notion that actually the way that I view the world is actually up to me. I can change that. And as a ski coach, well, one of the things that looking at, at mindfulness and that raising of awareness and that reflective and experiential practice has brought me to a situation where I'm really enjoying my ski coaching at the moment. Because I'm seeing it that I'm helping others gain some clarity about themselves. That's what I'm doing. I might not be totally clear about it, but that's okay. Because in this situation, my job is to help others to be clear about it. And that places me into that whole context of being an energy worker. Thank you.